The Lord desires faithfulness from you and I. That's what he wants. It's that simple. We can see it all through scripture. But not just for a moment in time or for a short period. The Lord requires of us faithfulness unto the end. We're going to see what faithfulness looks like in the eyes of God. In today's Wake Up Call, good morning, this is your Wake Up Call. It's Wake Up Call 125, Faithful Until the End. And this is part three of a series messages from Jesus. I'm so thankful that you're watching and that you're listening, that you're part of the faithful. You're part of this family of believers who have a desire to seek the Lord, to grow in the power of his might and in in his strength and in the anointing of the Lord. And that's what we want. We want to follow Jesus and be faithful all of our days. Again, this is messages from Jesus, part three, faithful until the end. Let's go to Revelation chapter 2 and start with verse 8. Revelation chapter 2, starting with verse 8. Now, if you're just now tuning in or watching this video or in this playlist, please know there are two parts prior to this where we look at Revelation chapter 1, the author and the penman of the messages from Jesus. And then, of course, the first church that Jesus speaks to, the church of Ephesus, the loveless church. And we talk about how we can rekindle our first love. If you missed those, go check them out. They're on the podcast that you're listening to, the YouTube channel, or the playlist that you're watching right now. This is part three, Faithful Until the End. Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. We'll read these verses and then we'll break it down. Let's begin. Verse 8, to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these things say the first and the last who was dead and came to life. I know your works tribulation, and poverty. But you were rich, and I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Revelation 2 verses 8 through 11. This message is written to the church in Smyrna. This is one of two churches out of the seven messages that Jesus gives to seven different churches. Two of them have nothing that Jesus calls out. If you remember from last time, in each one of these messages from Jesus to the church, but also, of course, to you and I, believers, who who is the church? You and I, we are the church. We make up the church. So these messages that were written to these literal, real churches in the day and age of when John the Apostle was was still living, probably the late 70, 80, 90 A.D. era around that time, Within a, you know, not even a hundred years, uh, 50, 60, 70 years after Christ has come to the earth, ministered on the earth, he has died, he has been resurrected and ascended to the right hand of the Father. And now he's speaking to the churches and still today he's speaking to you and I through his word. So these messages are very relevant and everything that Jesus says to these actual literal churches that existed at that time, Those words are still alive and powerful and can change our lives, bring us to a place of repentance, but also to a place of strength and stability, which is what God desires for us. And in this case, a place of being faithful, faithful until the end, faithful, as the Bible says, unto death for faithfulness for our entire lives. And this message is written to this church in Smyrna. Now, as I mentioned before, and I always like to give credit where credit is due, uh, I'm going to read out of this past, uh, a portion of this book, Revelation, illustrated and made plain by Tim LaHaye. Of course, he's one of the authors, a co-author with Jerry, is it Jenkins, I believe, that of course authored the, uh, the timeless Christian classic series, Left Behind. Maybe you've read them, maybe you watched the movies. But nonetheless, before that, he did a, he did a pretty you know, sound work on the book of Revelation. So let me read this to you so you can kind of have a historical understanding and context of the city of Smyrna where this church is located. 
Tim LaHaye writes, the church in Smyrna was a much persecuted church in a wealthy city that had little time for Christians. The city itself, founded about three centuries before Christ, was a well-planned accomplishment of Alexander the Great, the commercial center of Asia Minor. It was on the direct trade route from India and Persia to Rome. The large variety of coins found by archaeologists in the city clearly indicates that it was a wealthy city. The Jewish segment of the population seems to have been the most irreligious and neglectful of spiritual things. Few spe specific details can, are known of the history of the Smyrna church other than that which is given here in the book of Revelation, which we just read. It can be safely deduced, however, that it was a most faithful church in the face of persecution. From the account here in Scripture, the known characteristics of the conditions in the church at Smyrna indicate that the judgment seat of Christ will reveal this church to be one of the most outstanding local body of believers in all of church history. And that just kind of gives you a, a, a very, very quick synopsis, a very short summary, really, and kind of gets you the understanding of where this church is located. They are located in a city called Smyrna. It is a heavily populated city. It is a trade route city. Anytime in ancient history a city was located along the path of a trade route, that meant there would be many people coming in and out. And when people are traveling in and out, they bring with them lots of money. They bring with them different types of foods, different types of clothing, but they also bring with them much uh, religion, pagan religions, all types of gods. They bring with them all types of practices, whether good or bad, whether holy or wicked. And this city certainly was, like many of the cities uh, uh, on trade routes, it was a city that was full of all types of evils, and wickedness, but even there in the midst of this, there was a strong, faithful church. Now, let's break down this passage and look at what Jesus is saying to you and I. Verse 8, And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. Now, remember, in each one of these messages from Jesus, Jesus is pulling an attribute or a characteristic from Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, really starting at verse 8 into verse 20, Jesus is speaking and opening up these messages to, to the churches, and he is describing who he is. John is seeing Jesus Christ in his glorified form. We talked about that in the part 1, author and penman. The author of these messages is Jesus, the penman, of course, John inspired by the Holy Spirit. But we, we looked at Jesus and how he actually looks right now in his glorified body in heaven as the high priest of our confession at the right hand of the Father who is there for and he will be there for all of eternity and, and until of course he raptures his church and then of course the second coming of Christ when he comes to the earth to make all things right, to vanquish things, set up a millennial reign, a literal millennial reign of his kingdom. Satan will be let out one last time. Revelation chapter 20 shows us that. And many as the, as the sand on the seashore will rise up with Satan and God will vanquish all those that rebel one last time, then there will be a new heavens and a new earth. Now, in the book of Revelation chapter 1, we see how Jesus looks and appears right now. Revelation 19 shows us how he looks and appears as well right now as he is in heaven. Flames of fire in his eyes, holy and pure, a robe like a priest, white and pure, a girdle gold like a king. But notice what he says to the church in Smyrna. I am the first and the last who was dead and came to life. Well, if you were to read Revelation 1 verse 17, it says this. And when I saw him, this is John speaking, I fell at his feet as dead. He fell under the power of God. I mean, he, he sees this vision of God. He's so astounded. He falls to his feet like a dead man. But he laid his right hand on me. This is Jesus saying to me, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. Well, in Revelation 1 verse 8, Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Alpha and Omega, of course, are Greek letters, and it is the first and the last letters of the Greek alphabet. It would be like Jesus saying, of course, I speak English, that's my native tongue. It would be like saying, Jesus said, you know, Jesus, I am Jesus. I'm the A and the Z. 
<laughs> I'm the beginning and the end. I'm the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Well, in verse 18, it says this, I am he, Revelation 1, 18, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. So Jesus is presenting himself to this particular church, the faithful church, this persecuted church, the church of Smyrna, as the eternal one. I am the first and the last. The book of Hebrews tells us that all things were made by God and made by his word. Hebrews 11 verse 3, by faith we understand that the worlds, the ages, the very things that are around us were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. If you were to go to John chapter 1, John chapter 1 is basically like Genesis 1 for the New Testament in a sense. But John chapter 1 verse 1, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. In the, and he, notice, he, the word, was in the beginning with God. Verse 3, all things were made through him and without him nothing was made that was made. So Jesus, he is the word. He has always been and he will forever be. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. We see that in the book of Revelation as well. He's the author and finisher of our faith. He's the first and the last. He is the alpha and the omega. And he is presenting himself as the eternal one to this church in Smyrna. Now, why might he be presenting that particular attribute of himself, that particular characteristic? Why the eternal reality? Of course, it's true, and it's good for all of us to know that. But why to this church? This church is experiencing persecution. There are people that are being put to death. And it's important to understand that when you experience persecution, when, there is, when people attack you, because not really honestly anything against you, but it's the God inside of you that they're striking out against. But when people persecute believers, the hope, the faith that a believer must keep is, I'm serving one who is eternal. He was God before I showed up on this planet. He'll be God even after I leave. And if by chance I leave by way of giving my life for him, giving my life for the word of God, the gospel, which many believers have. There are, many, there are countless believers. It's called martyrs, right? Martyrdom. And you really you could be a martyr for any type of cause. But the only worthy cause to give your life for is the gospel, is for the faith and the belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only thing worthy giving, giving your life for. And, and you might say, well, maybe you give your life for freedom of a country. Of course that's worthy. Or for your family. Of course that's worthy. But really, what does the Bible say? No greater love has a man than that he would lay down his life for his friends. So when you give your life for, your, for freedom, for, for the values that you esteem, esteem and hold up in a country, like in the great nation of the United States of America, to have liberty though many are trying to take it and attack it and shrink it, or for your family. Well, sure, those are, those, are, those are valid, honorable things. And, and I would suggest are rooted in real Christ-like love and a real God kind of love, a selfless type of love. And so there are many people in this church, but also over the centuries, that have given their life for Christ. And what a worthy thing to do. What a, what, a, what, what a glorious thing to do with your life. Now, as I've heard one minister say, and I think it's probably pretty true, you know, you don't have to just go like look out and seek to become a martyr. Persecution will come. It'll find you. Uh, the, the Bible tells us in, in Mark, chapter, Mark chapter 10, Mark chapter 10, Jesus is teaching his disciples and he's teaching them about, you know, giving up. Essentially, it may cost you some things in a, mo in a moment's time. It may cost you a few things to follow Jesus. And the disciples, of course, many of them owning fishing businesses. I mean, they were very well off. They had lots of boats. They fished. They, they were doing good. They had good, strong businesses. And, G and Peter's like, 
verse 28 of Mark 10, Peter began to say to him, See, we have left all and followed you. Verse 29, Jesus answered and said, Assuredly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels, who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time. Houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. So Jesus made it very aware. And it's not an uncommon thing to understand that if you follow Christ, there will be some people that don't like you. They'll, and we'll get into that in just a, in a few minutes in greater detail. But before we do that, look, let's see what the next thing that Jesus says. I am the first and the last, the one who was dead and who came to life. Now verse 9. Now remember, in each one of these messages, Jesus first begins with, hey, this is what you're doing good. And then he says, this is where you need to have some correction. Then he gives counsel or wisdom on how to correct it. Then he shows the reward if you'll correct it. Interestingly enough, this is one of two churches that don't have anything to correct. They're actually doing everything well. Verse 9. Revelation 2, verse 9, Jesus says, I know your works, tribulation, and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Now, Jesus pulls out three things here that he knows about these believers in Smyrna. First off, I know your works. Here's the thing, and you need to be well aware of it, and it is a cover-to-cover -cover doctrine in the Bible. It's not Old Testament. It is purely New Testament as well. But the Lord knows what we do, and He rewards our lives here and in eternity based on what we do with what we've been given and with our life. This is why it's so necessary to be faithful in what we do. Letting the faith we have in Jesus dictate how we live our lives. 1 Peter 1.17 says this, And if you call on the Father who without partiality, he doesn't play favorites, judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves through the time of your stay here on earth in fear. See, the Lord is judging. He's watching. And Malachi chapter 3 shows that there is a book of remembrance. There are several books in heaven. One of them is a book of remembrance that writes down the things that the righteous and the wicked do. And that book, I believe, will be brought out along with the book of life because it shows us in Revelation 20 and the second death, books are brought out. Because the Lord sees and He is judging what we do. And the works of these believers were found faithful. The second thing that Jesus points out in the church of Smyrna is that they are experiencing tribulations. Now again, that's persecution, tribulations, persecution. We saw where Jesus said, hey, persecution will come. Persecution will come. There, now, keep in mind, though, there will be blessing attached to it. See, here's the thing. What is persecution? It's simply Satan working through people whose eyes, are spiritual eyes, are blinded. They think they hate you. But really, the spirit that has deceived them the spirit of Satan, the spirit of Antichrist, the things that are against God, they motivate these people who are in deception. And being deceived, they attack believers naturally in the flesh, literally taking people's lives, homes, jobs, you know, banning them. Uh, th this is something that took place in Smyrna. Smyrna was like many cities in that day and age, tra a trade guild city. So there were trade guilds. Think of, in my mind, the easiest way to understand this is like a union. So if you have a union at a company or a union in a city, it's basically all the employees are gathered together. They're banded together in a union or a guild in this sense in the ancient world. And they're in a guild, a union. And so they basically watch out for each other's rights when it comes to earning a living. If you're not in the union, you can't do certain jobs or you might not be able to participate 
in particular trades if you're not in the union, if the union controls that city or that era, uh, area. Same way in Smyrna. There were guilds, maybe coppersmiths, silversmiths, different types of tradesmen. If you weren't in the guild, you didn't get to participate in the economy or the marketplace in that city. And there were many people who became believers and they were kicked out of their guilds. They can still perfectly work with silver or copper, whatever it may be, stonesmith. But if they're not in the guild, they lost their job. Still today, there are believers, if they keep their faith in Christ, if they refuse to renounce their faith in Christ, it will cost them some money. I know your works, your tribulation, and poverty, though you were rich. Now, here's something you need to make sure that you do not do. You don't create a doctrine of poverty. And what I mean by that is, unfortunately, this has happened many times. You're not more holy because you're poor. You're not less holy if you're rich. In fact, 1 Timothy 6, which has that famous verse that's oftentimes misquoted, and the misquotation is, well, how many know, brother, how many knows the root of all evil is money? That's not what it says. It says the root of all evil or the root of all kinds of evil is the love of money. The Bible instructs us not to spend all of our energy and effort just trying to get rich. Rather, we should spend our entire effort and ability and strength and being obedient to God and following the call of God on our life. But like any faithful servant and worker, when we're faithful to what we are called, the master sees it and rewards us richly. And, and in 1 Timothy chapter 6, if you keep reading, it actually says, Timothy, charge those that are wealthy not to put their trust in their riches, but put their trust in God and to use their riches to bless other people. So it has nothing to do. Your spiritual relationship, your, your, the intimacy of your relationship with Christ is not dependent upon wealth, rich or poor. Now, with that, and, and interestingly enough, Jesus says in Luke chapter 16, if you can't manage money, mammon, if you can't manage wealth, which is a lesser thing, why do you think you'll receive greater blessings, which are spiritual? Spiritual blessings are far greater than material blessings. But Jesus is saying if you can't be trusted with a material thing that's, you know, if you gave me this pen and I can't keep up with this pen, why would you give me a, a pickup truck? You know, if you gave me this pen and said, AJ, this is a beautiful pen, I want you to take care of it. Don't lose it. Make sure it's always got a, a cartridge in it full of ink. And you came back three weeks later, hey, how's the pen? I'm like, what pen? I lost it 17 seconds after you gave it to me. You're probably not going to give me a pickup truck. <laughs> oh, well, I was going to give you this, you know, nowadays, fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 pickup truck, but you couldn't handle a $22 pen. And that's what Jesus is saying in Luke 16. So again, don't create a doctrine of poverty. These believers and Christians, they were impoverished in the moment here because they refused to trade their faith in Christ for an opportunity to participate in the marketplace. And if it comes down to that, you and I should do the same thing. Regardless of the cost, I'm going to be faithful to Jesus. Now, they, Jesus also knows something about people that are, aren't in the church. He says, verse 9, I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but they're the synagogue of Satan. Verse 10, do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. You will have tribulation 10 days, but be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. There's several things going on in these two verses, Revelation 2, chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. Who are these Jewish people? In the city of Smyrna, there was a large sect of Jewish people people that were very, as I read earlier, irreligious. They were Jewish in descent, maybe even Jewish in religious practice, but they didn't really follow the law of Moses because if they did, they too would have become Christians. Because the end result of following the teachings of the Old Testament is Christ. That's what the whole book of Hebrews is about. That's what Jesus said to the Pharisees. He's like, if you guys actually believed in Moses like you say you did, you would believe in me. Now, we don't see it from Scripture here, but 
church history, so take it with a grain of salt, but probably pretty accurate. Church history says that a gentleman, a believer named Polycarp, P-O-L-Y-C-A-R-P, I think of the fish, carp, <laughs> but Polycarp, he was more than likely the bishop or the overseer or the angel, the messenger, the pastor of this church in Smyrna. Polycarp, as it, history goes, ancient record goes, he was called out by the people of the city, persecuted, and then wrongly accused and put to death. And apparently there was a large sect of Jewish people, followers, that weren't really following the word of God and the laws of Moses, but Jewish in appearance, not in like physical appearance, but in their religious practice. And even Jesus is saying, they got a synagogue, but it's not of God, it's of Satan. It's activity of Satan's taking place there. The, the account goes that they went to burn Polycarp alive. And the fires wouldn't burn him. It, it would burn up the wood around it, but it wouldn't burn him. Kind of makes you think of like John, who was boiled alive in oil, but he wouldn't die. So that's why he's on Patmos, and he's seeing these visions that Jesus is giving him. So then they just stabbed Polycarp to death. Nonetheless, he was martyred, and he did live in Smyrna. And it's believed that he was this messenger that was being spoken to, which isn't that wonderful, isn't that so kind and merciful of Jesus that he, he's going to give his life for the gospel, as many have, and he's encouraging him, don't be afraid. How do you overcome persecution? Two ingredients to overcome persecution. Don't be fearful and continue to be faithful. If you're experiencing persecution, you have to make two decisions. I refuse to be afraid of man because I fear God. You either will fear God and not fear man, or you'll fear man and never fear God. But there is a blessing here and in eternity for fearing God. So if you'll fear God and remain faithful, you can overcome every form and attack of persecution. That's what's being said in verse 10. Don't fear, be faithful unto death. And so these Jews, they are persecuting the believers. Now, what's so amazing, wow, I, I mean, it's just when you can you kind of get a little bit deeper in Bible study, Jesus told his believers this would happen. John chapter 16, verse 1, These things I've spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. Verse 2, they'll put you out of the synagogues. You have to create your own places of worship. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. Wasn't Paul doing that before he was called into the ministry and wondrously saved and drafted into the kingdom? Verse 3, these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things I've told you that when the time comes you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I did Yes, I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. Now, verse 33 of the same chapter, John 16, 33. These things I've spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. That's something you have to keep in your mind. That will keep you from being fearful and that will keep you being faithful. Knowing that the one you serve, he's overcome the world. Tribulation, persecution, it can come and go. But my faithfulness in Christ, I will purpose myself to remain faithful in Christ. And I will be faithful to the end by the power and the grace of the Holy Spirit indwelling in my life and in yours. Because the Bible tells us in Matthew 24, verse 13, Matthew 24 and 25, much of its teaching is, uh, or my, Matthew 24, much of its teaching is on the second coming of Christ. But Matthew 24, verse 13 is a good biblical principle. It says this, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. The life you and I are living right now is a testing ground. It, it is the test of faith. The life you have right now is now the test of faith. And endurance or faithfulness to the end is what is required to us. Because it is the person that's faithful to the end, not for a moment in time, but to the end of their life. That is the person that shall be saved. And there is a reward for faithfulness. There is a reward for faithfulness. Notice verse 10 of Revelation 2. 
be faithful unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life. I will give you the crown of life if you're faithful unto death. James 1 verse 12, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, trials, tribulations, persecutions, for when he has been approved, overcome them, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Notice the connection of love and faithfulness. If I love Christ, I'll be faithful. And if I'm faithful, I'm showing my love for Christ. And by being faithful and loving to Christ and loving Christ and being faithful, they're intertwined, you can't separate them. You'll endure temptation. You'll be approved of by God. And you will receive this crown of life, salvation, eternal life. Verse 11, Revelation verse 11, chapter 2, verse 11. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Here's the reward for faithfulness. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. What is the second death? Well, if we look at a couple other passages in the book of Revelation, we can see what the second death is. If we go to Revelation chapter 20, starting at verse 6, it says this, Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Drop down to verse 11 of Revelation 20. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books, plural. Verse 13, the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. That is a phrase that's used so many times in the New Testament, each according to his works. Verse 14, then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Verse 15, anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. What is the second death? If a person dies and they have not put their faith in Christ and Jesus is not Lord of their life and they die in their sins, they are separated from God and immediately their spirit and soul go to the place called hell or Hades, the Greek word for it. But that is the abode of the dead. That's the holding place of the wicked dead, the unrighteous dead, those who died without having their sins cleansed or washed away from them and their account blotted out and their name written in the book of life. They didn't believe in Jesus. Jesus was not their Lord and they died in their sins. They had no one to stand on their behalf before God the Father, the righteous judge, and declare them innocent because their sins would lay, were laid on Christ. And that person will remain in hell until the great white throne judgment. That takes place after the rapture of the church, after the tribulation, after the second coming of Christ, after the millennial reign of Christ. Then the second de death that will be applied to those people who are in hell, they will be brought before the great white throne judgment only the dead, only the wicked dead, the unrighteous dead will be brought there. The, the righteous dead and believers will be brought before the Bema seat of Christ, the judgment seat of Christ in heaven. But the great white throne of judgment will be for the wicked, unrighteous dead. They will be judged according to their works since they have no mediator. They have no go-between. They have no redeemer, Christ. They'll be judged guilty and they'll be cast into this place called the lake of fire. And that is the second death. You could think of it, I, I think it's the best analogy I've ever heard. My, my dad is the one I heard say it. But you could think of hell like county jail. You're in county jail until it's court date. And if you're judged guilty, you go to the state penitentiary. Hades, hell, lake of fire. County jail, penitentiary. It's not that there's any less judgment or more judgment. Purgatory, that's a myth. No such thing. But what the reality is, it's a holding place until there is a second death or final judgment. You're, it is still torment. 
It is still weeping and gnashing of teeth. And it's still a place that no person in their right mind would want to go to. But if they're under deception, they don't even know they're headed that direction. And as I felt the Lord lead me the last time, I'm going to do it again this time. And every time we have a message from Jesus that we look at in detail. If you're watching and listening and you've never put your faith in Christ, you can't be faithful to the end. You can't be faithful unless you have faith. Faithfulness is simply an expression of your faith in Christ. And until you put your faith in Christ, you can't be faithful to the end, which means you will not receive a crown of life, which means you will not be protected, but rather you'll experience the second death. But here's the good news of Jesus. You don't have to. Christ came to save sinners. And if you're watching and listening and you've never put your faith in Christ or at some point in time you have and you've fallen away and you need to return to faithfulness, I want you to pray this prayer with me now. Say, Father, in the, G in the name of Jesus, I believe you sent your only begotten Son, Christ Jesus, to die on the cross for my sins. I believe three days later, by the power of the Spirit, he rose from the dead. It's by that same power, the Holy Spirit, I'm being made alive now in Christ. For I confess Jesus is Lord. Jesus is my Lord. Wash me clean. Purge me. Make me white as snow. And I'll live for you, faithful all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer... Make sure you look in the description of wherever you're listening or watching to this message from Jesus. And there will be a link that goes to my church, Gospel Tabernacle. If you tap on that link, fill out the form, I want to send to you completely free my pastor's study guide, Pastor Leon's Bible Basic Study Guide. Because what we want to do is we want to give you something, put something in your hands that you can read and study with your Bible Having now prayed the prayer of salvation and received the free gift of salvation, now it's time to enter in that journey of discipleship. And that 12-lesson study guide will help you become a strong believer in Christ Jesus. It will answer many questions you have right now, and it will make you a strong disciple and follower of Christ. And it will help you remain faithful until the end. I'm so thankful for you. I appreciate you watching and listening. And remember, we are the faithful. I'll see you next time. God bless you.